Ladies and gentlemen, we have a very special guest once again on the program, Dr. Valentina Zarkova, Professor Valentina Zarkova. Many people in our last video who are, unfortunately, I don't know if you're aware, you have enemies. They say that Valentina Zarkova doesn't know what she's talking about. She's just a mathematician. She is not a solar physicist. And I say, what? In fact, Valentina graduated with honors and a distinctive degree in math from Kiev National University in 1975, but she then did a PhD in astrophysics with radiative transfer of solar prominence at the main astronomical observatory in Kiev in 84. So on top of that, she's won awards the SOHO MDO Team Award for the Discovery of Sunquakes in 1999, Awards for Outstanding Research in 2005, and the National Science Foundation U.S. Award for Advanced Studies of Solar Flares in 2002. So that's your street cred. Welcome to the show. Hi. <laughs> so what do you say to your detractors and your naysayers that say you're not a plasma physicist or a solar physicist? Well... What can I say? I have about 200 publications and um, two monographs and uh, four book chapters. <laughs> so, and they're all in solar plasma physics, I'm afraid. Some of them are mathematics, but mostly, as you can see, these are my published books, um, monographs. Mostly I was doing... Uh, investigating solar flares and plasma in them and acceleration of particles and their precipitation. But then we happened to do uh, artificial pattern recognition and then produced very nice databases and everything. And uh, then publish another book, which, which is probably some of you bought on artificial intelligence and recognition. This is the uh, first time we deviated from astronomy. We include some medical images, but mostly it was 14 chapters about astrophysical images on the sunspot active regions and, um, uh, and uh, filaments. So then if you do an a ADS service, it is uh, abstract in um, where it is in harvard so you can download my papers so my topics main topics were um, solar physics so from from the year 75 until now on but why are mathematicians because in astrophysics in solar physics all the ideas all the models are strongly mathematical so in the uk most of the uh astrophysical and solar physics scientists are working in the math department. So this is how it happened. So for over 45 years, you've been publishing papers on solar physics, and there is absolutely not a single person that can deny your credentials. Now, this is all, <laughs> <laughs> this is all culminating in uh, your most controversial work, the 2015 paper, Heartbeat of the Sun. And yeah. we're going to be talking about um, some specifics about that in just a moment. Uh, can you bring up, there's the paper. And yeah, there's the paper. It yeah. can be read by anyone. It's not controversial. It was very nice. It was actually in press release of the Royal Astronomical Society because it's the uh, first time we brought attention that we are approaching to the grand solar minimum. And at that time, we even didn't realize that it will be such a big impact we we just discovered we we thought well it is interesting that we will be observing it we didn't realize how many people invested into the fact proving that the sun has nothing to do with any anything on the earth so yeah that's, that's uh, yeah that's the bizarre world we live in we've got the majority of people out there thinking that the sun is not does not control the climate and it is in fact plant food but that is a different podcast. So using your mathematical analysis in this paper in 2015, you came up with a summary curve um, that showed yes. high correlation to what the sun's activity is going to be in the next few decades. Now, yes. for the listeners out there, we are all dying for Valentina Zarkova's definition of grand solar minimum. 
Now, there's a lot of people that make their own definition of grand solar minimum, but based on the research I've done, uh, you cannot determine the span of the grand solar minimum until after it's over. And then you can pick a starting point and an ending point. You can assume you're entering one, but there's no way to specifically predict the end point or the start point until it happens. Would you agree with that statement? Um, no, not necessarily, because you have some flexibility what you are predicting. I would put you this um, slide, which I normally put for my students, because I teach them waves and they have to uh, look at this. So if you have two waves, what pr predicting, you have two waves propagating and they have uh, slightly off um, face. So the one wave runs away in front of other. So these two first, if you see on the right slide, one wave and another, and they come either in anti-face or they come completely in the face. And the blue line beneath gives you the summary uh, wave. So if these waves are anti-face, the amplitude is zero, is waves come in the same phase, the amplitude doubles. So this is basically what we did with our detection of our waves in, in here. So what, what we seen where we detected two waves, if I show you here, this is what we report in that paper in um, Nature in 2015. So what we detected, we detected two eigenvectors defining two papers traveling inside the sun on the on its surface. And uh, on the left-hand side, there were waves we detected, we measured from observations. So we took full disk magnetic field and detected these waves from um, 30 latitudes of, of the sun. And uh, then this is what we predicted uh, with the uh, dashed and normal line and the solid line. So the one is predicted from formula and the other one is um, from real measurements. By that time, we got this measurement. And this is what we predicted for the next two cycles, which now cycle 25 and the cycle 26. What we showing reminded the previous slide that the waves go in antiphase. In cycle 25, they are not fully in antiphase, but cycle 26, they are nearly fully in antiphase. It means that the resulting wave amplitude in cycle 25 is reduced, and in cycle 25, reduced very dramatically. So this is the bottom, how it looks. So in cycle 25, this is your summary wave. And this is cycle 26 reduced by 70%. So this is gave us um, indication that, oh, probably we are heading to the minimum of solar activity. But by that time, when we done this in 2014, we didn't know how it act with response to others. So then we did simulations of this formula for 2000 years from 1200 to 3200. And this is what we discovered. We discovered these uh, uh, bumps of solar activity, grand solar cycles. These are normal solar cycles. These are small 11 year solar cycles. And then you have this grand solar cycle separated some kind of reduced uh, amplitude. We call it grand solar minima. And then you got another solar cycle and where we are, we marked with this ellipse, there are three cycles which we used to detect this curve. And we discovered, oh my God, we are just at the verge of entering into Grand Solar Minimum, which we already entered because it was published 2015 and Grand Solar Minimum started 2020. So we entered it. And then we discovered that it will be another Grand Solar Cycle after this Grand Solar Minimum. And then another grand solar minimal and another cycle and another. So after I show you how wave interfere and that we detected two waves in the solar interior, it becomes very clear that interference these waves obviously modulates the amplitude of the cycles 
And this is why we have this kind of ground solar minima. So now, based on the amplitude there on your graph, yeah, it appears as if the cancellation coming up in cycle 26 and maybe 27 is going to be more severe than all of the little ice age. Well, just on amplitude, is, I mean, is, what is that yes, representing? Strong, stronger constellation, definitely the amplitude in these three cycles, probably lower than the bed during mountain minimum, or maybe compared to the mountain minimum just right. before 1700, somewhere here. So maybe you need to look at the numbers, but the beauty of it that we did calculations, I will show you just a second. We calculated how the grand minimum was looking in mountain minimum. So this observation of mountain minimum sunspot. And these are our model, which predicts exactly 1700, 1710, and 1720. We predict these points. And this is how the grand solar minimum will be looking for the current one from 2020. So this is your cycle 25, this is cycle 26, and this is 27. So they, they are, probably they will be similar like in grand, in mountain minimum, because the cycle 26 similar like this one, you don't see nearly uh, any, uh, Let, any mounder. Let's keep this graph up. I think it's critical for the general public to understand. These are butterfly mm -hmm. diagrams or mm -hmm. some or a simulation of a butterfly diagram that you did mathematically, correct? Yes, we after we uh, adjusted the dynamo to the results we obtained uh, from two waves, we suddenly managed to reproduce here. We managed to reproduce with dynamo model. This is below the observed summary curve. And this is simulated summary curve. And as you can see, the parameters of dynamo model fit so well that the even shape of the grand minima are nearly identical. So this is like increased in the center. This is increased in the center. This is expanded like has two maxima. This is the one. This is like round. That one. So you see, we suddenly, after we started using this um, new formula derived from magnetic field, we can now rely on the dynamo model producing nearly correct amplitudes and correct cycles. This is for 2000 years. And this is after, only after that, we turned back to butterfly diagram and said, let's check how we represent. And we found that indeed we can represent when there were bust of solar activity during Mount the Minimum, exactly. These are two busts shown here. These are <laughs> to 1700, 1710, 1720. These are shown. And these are uh, 1690, 1700, which we see absence of it. So this gave us indication that obviously we're on the right track, on the right direction. Yeah. Well, one thing I want to point out here that a lot of people are unaware of and, and some of the detractors and the naysayers on the whole concept of grand solar minimum say there's no way we're in a grand solar minimum. There are sunspots on the sun. And yeah, these this is exactly where sunspots should appear. Yeah. The, the, the butterfly diagram shows you that even in grand minima, there are still, still sunspots. Yeah, there are still sunspots <laughs> because... Uh, we entered the grand solar minimum, but it doesn't mean the amplitude immediately drops to zero. Yeah. It, it is the same amplitude. It's simply you have less sunspots, but you still have sunspot here. You will have less sunspot in cycle 26 because amplitude will drop by 70%, but you still have some sunspots during cycle 26 as well. How about N27, but maybe just a few. Uh, 27 will become... Uh, slightly better than 26. As I said, the current grand solar minimum is um, much shorter than Mounder. It's only three cycles. So the effect probably will not be as long and as dramatic as it was for Mounder minimum, which had six cycles affected by grand solar minimum.
Well, this is a great segue to bring us to your new paper uh, that came out last year. Um, the effects, terrestrial volcanic eruptions and their links with solar activity. Now, in the paper that you concluded that, well, this is kind of a, a really good segue to general solar science. A lot of people know about the solar cycle that's 11 years. What they're unaware of, that it is only half of a solar polar reversal. So when the North and South Pole just flip one time, that's a single solar cycle. Yes. The, the full solar polar reversal, north to south and back again, takes mm -hmm. two solar cycles. And that is called a hail cycle, which is around 22 years. Yes. Now, what you found in this paper on the terrestrial volcanic activity is that volcanic activity increases only once every other cycle. When the yes, solar, exactly. the southern field is in the south, is that what it is? Yes, when the southern hemisphere, so basically what you need to go here, that the volcanic activity is increased when your southern hemisphere has a, a high, higher uh, activity. So normally it's all uh, even cycle, cycle 22, 24, 26. The red line, which is southern polarity and blue northern, you see that in cycle 21, northern polarity higher. So this um, resulting field, resulting field of eigenvector here will be northern polarity. When you come to the cycle 22, the amplitude of the southern uh, eigenvector is higher than and northern, so the amplitude will be southern. So this is what uh, we compared with eigenvectors for southern and northern um, magnetic polarities. And it turned out that volcanic activity somehow always, um, at least for 10 last cycles, what we, um, it has um, very strong correlation with this 22 year cycle 22 years so and it is maximum when southern eigenvector dominates so southern magnetic polarity southern hemisphere is more active so if we come back where we are now we cycle 25 2023 20, somewhere here so we see the next cycle when the southern polarity would dominate will be cycle 26 so um if you skip this is from Mount the minimum. We might come back later. Can you back to the? Yeah, here we come to the yes uh, volcanic eruptions. So first uh, we look at the volcanic eruptions from 1750. It's about a thousand of them. Build this curve and then decided to look how would they depend on the solar cycle, uh, on the single solar cycle, or it turns out that they do not depend much on single solar cycle. You see this blue line, it is um, um, shows that like maximum during the minimum of um, solar activity. This is what people were thinking. And when you think logically, why would volcanic eruption would be maximal when solar activity minimal? It doesn't make any sense. So because we had in our hands the double solar cycle with different polarities, so we use here, this is our one cycle and this is another with different polarity. So when we build the number of volcanic eruptions, we discovered that the number of eruptions in, during the cycles when the uh, southern polarity dominates in eigenvector is maximum compared with the other places. So, and again, volcanic eruptions basically increases when the solar cycle magnetic field increases during the maximum of any cycles, but it is maximal during the southern magnetic polarity. But it is still, you see in the cycle 25 closer to this year and last year, number of vol volcan volcano erupted. This is because the number of eruptions coincide with the maximum of magnetic field. So obviously interaction of solar magnetic field and terrestrial magnetic field 
cause of these eruptions of volcanic uh, mass and so on. So this is what we discovered, but this was kind of um, not quantified. It is visualization. So you put a kind of um, big rectangular total number from this distance from that distance. But as a mathematician, you try to verify it in more uh, accurate way. So you try to look how this number of eruptions will be investigated, let's say, from the point of view spectral analysis. So what we did, we did wavelet spectral analysis. So this is our volcanic curve. We run wavelet, and this is the cone of influence which covers um, whether the data are available and whether they are not. And uh, the bl black line gives you global uh, wavelength spectrum integrated over the time. And you can see very clearly that uh, this uh, dashed line shows 95% uh, confidence, 95% uh, level confidence level. And you can see that period 21.4% is very strong period shown in the uh, volcanic eruptions. So this was from global wavelet, we discovered this um, period 21.4 years. And the same uh, four year spectrum repeated. We have this similar um, period. And uh, this uh, led us to the comparison of direct comparison of uh, the uh, volcanic eruptions shown the blue line and our summary curve for the previous uh, grand solar uh, grand solar cycle which we are coming from so from 1750 we have all these curves so this was our summary curve the only thing we did we normalize it to one so we put maximum is one and the rest of one divided by the number of amplitude of this and uh, the number of um, eruptions volcanic eruptions is also normalized to one so when you see so this what our summary curve so has negative polarity uh, positive polarity on northern polarity in this kind of period. And those which goes to the negative, it means they have southern polarity. So this is um, what you can see in this slide, in this plot. You, you see they like in antiphase. To prove it, we inverted this red curve. We multiply it by minus one. So now, this is the one is northern polarity and this is my southern polarity minus one so in this case you you now see that maximum of volcanic eruptions always happen during the cycles when the southern magnetic polarity is dominating in eigenvectors in here so you see the blue line is volcanic eruptions and the red line is uh, our summary curve. So this is southern polarity, this is northern polarity, southern and northern. So this is what, what we got. But this correlation only started appearing from 1860. Before, there was no such correlation, as you see. It was very shifted, but definitely something was happening before that we published another paper if you're interested you can go to our website comparing the sunspot indices with our summary curve and our modulus summary curve so we, we found very interesting results in there but definitely what we found that something happened in 1860 because when we started comparing our Two curves this red and blue curve in here and um, we run correlation analysis with SPS. well in 1860 there was a significant geomagnetic jerk exactly uh, and the northern uh geopole rapidly started moving across uh the northern hemisphere yes this is what 
indicated us to look what happened. Oh, there you go. The poles, <laughs> and we got the North Pole in uh, 1590, 750 shown by Green Line. It was moving somewhere far away in the lower latitude from the pole. But then from 1750 to 1860, it was moving far away to the somewhere to the south. And then in 1860, the geomagnetic jerk happened, restored and restored the order on the earth. And from this time, suddenly the eruptions of volcanic mass started going in line with the uh, solar magnetic field, mostly with the southern polarity of eigen vectors. So this is what, and this is because the magnetic pole started moving from the uh, southern latitudes towards the its real geographical position. This is what it will be in 2025. This is where it was 2018. Yeah, interesting. So, and uh, just to bring you, we produced the correlation be before a before 1868, before this geomagnetic jerk, there was very poor correlation. It was negative. We, we didn't have correlation between magnetic field and uh, um, volcanic eruption. But after that, suddenly this correlation grew up to 84%. So this is uh, this has become from 1868, 1950, the correlation grew to 18%. At eighty four percent. So, so the, the, the our magnetosphere has been weakening uh, during that same time frame. I wonder if there is some relationship with the weaker magnetosphere, more effect on the solar polar field on earthquakes. Is that or, or volcanoes? Is that even possible? No, the I would say it vice versa. It's solar magnetic field interferes with the magnetosphere of the Earth and produces hmm. some effects not vice versa. Our planet is so tiny, we can't affect anything. <laughs> Just uh, started listening to these AGW people who, who speak absolutely rubbish. So we cannot affect anything, not the sun for sure, not other planet, not even our own planet. So definitely it is solar magnetic field um, in the even cycles they have different polarity and they have such configurations so that you remember that the earth is inclined towards the sun so it interferes with the magnetic field so the sun rotates and we have this um, park spiral and this magnetic field comes through the um, magnetic field of magnetosphere when they interfere they produce very strong geomagnetic activity and this is what we observe from 1868 this is when our geomagnetic activity started correlated very closely with the variation of um, solar magnetic field so the bad news if you're listening is that we are going to have an uptick in volcanic activity but it's not going to start for maybe five or six years it is already here. If you look backwards, it started already. So as you see, the solar activity is increased even if the magnetic polarity is uh, northern. It, it increased uh, above minimum anyway. So it is increased. It not increased as much as it will increase in the next cycle. So this is the cycle 25. It is increased now. We have eruption in Etna. We had eruptions where... Uh, only yesterday reported in Hawaii because uh, the sun is in its maximum. We still have flares. We still have sunspot. It is cycle 25 as usual. It's going as usual. It's slightly lower than 24, maybe the same magnitude. So it is going on. Simply, we don't have as many sunspot outside active regions. So this is why probably the radiation which comes from the sun is reducing and so reducing the temperature, but the number of volcanic eruptions slightly increased. We can say that it is not increased. It will decrease next uh, probably five, six years, but after we pass minimum 
or between cycle 25 and 26 and start approaching to the maximum of cycle 26, this is where the main fun will come and the volcanic eruption will be increasing <laughs> and probably will be like we had when it was about 10 years ago when um, in Green, no, not Greenland, in Iceland. Uh, in Iceland, yeah, it was eruption that stopped flying all the planes because they couldn't get through. Yeah, volcanic the, ash stops engines and kills people. So you got to stay away from yeah, that. Yeah. Well, uh, there was a paper that came out maybe eight years ago um, that was discussing siliceous rich magma and explosive volcanoes that cosmic rays the muons in the uh, penetrating in the subsurface heat siliceous rich magma and mm -hmm. their uh hypothesis was and if you look at the top right at vei six and seven eruptions the majority mm -hmm. of them are occurring at solar minimums and the paper uh mm -hmm. the paper reported that it's only the silica rich magma the explosive volcanoes those are typically the vei six or greater mm -hmm. those the muons are heating the magma in the subsurface due to increased cosmic rays, which happen during solar minimum. So uh, have you read the paper and do you have any comments on it? Yeah, I've seen the paper. So it doesn't um, contradict what we do. There could be two effects working simultaneously because no, I because you it seems like the majority of the eruptions are happening at these peaks of the magnetic field. But if you look, the few big VEI six or sevens, exactly, those are doing yeah. the minimums. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it could be this um, mechanism they're proposing, it does work exactly for the large eruptions because they do not uh, affect the data statistically because they're very small number of them, one, two, three, four, five. But the fact that they occur during the minima and probably affected by this cosmic race, I, I don't have any objections whatsoever. Excellent. <laughs> well, <clears throat> like I was telling you uh, before we started the interview, the last interview we did is the only uh, podcast I have that got demonetized. And I don't know if it's because we mention anthropogenic global warming, um, but nothing we talk about is that controversial or unscientific. We're certainly not conspiracy theorists and everything you and I discuss is based on some type of scientific inquiry or fact. Yeah. So what is it? Are we going in the right direction? Are more people understanding that this climate alarmism is, is based very little on science and, and mostly a religion? What, what are you feeling since the last time we talked? Do you see any shift in the science? Well, I see more and more people started believing that Grand Solar Minimum is here because what they observe, this is what we predicted. The temperature is dropping. You remember what was how cold it was before Christmas in the United States? It was snowing. And I, I made pictures from, from your side. I'll show you. This well, night. a record snowpack in the West, numbers Absolutely. that have oh, yeah, never here, been recorded. Here yours. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they were huge. We also had snow uh, a week before Christmas for two weeks in the UK. And uh, even in Australia and New Zealand, they had snow in late November, beginning of December, which is December is their summer. But they never had snow end of November. And this is snow from New from, uh Australia and New Zealand, this is what they had. So now they have to believe that what we said, it is true. So we need to come back and look at the another paper. It was paper by Schindel 208. This is, I published um, some paper in 2020 discussing the paper Schindel who shown how the temperature changed during Mount the Minimal and the whole globe during Mount the Minimum. So when we had um, uh, glaciers, we had sea swept south from Arctic and Danube and Thames River uh, frozen. So this is their map published in science. And uh, they reckon the drop of temperature was related to drop abundances of ozone created by deficit of solar ultraviolet radiation in stratosphere. 
And this lead, less ozone, what it did, so if you have enough ozone, you have this nice jet stream streaming around the mid latitude, producing gold stream and everything, everything comes in order. But when you have not enough ozone, what is happening that cold air from the north make these big raids to the south and they create these Greek wiggles, wavy jet streams, a so-called North Atlantic oscillation is kicked. And this is what we seen in America and Canada. In Russia, they didn't mention it, but in Siberia and Central Russia, they had huge frosts as well. In Siberia, they had frost. They never had minus 65. They never had below 50. This year, they had very low frost. So this is what happened already this year. And this is only the third year from ground solar minimum. And the sun is still and its maximum of solar activity in cycle 25. So now you can extrapolate when the sign will start moving from maximum to the descending phase towards the minimum between cycle 25 and 26, this excursion of cold air become much more frequent and much further. Oh, I don't know if you heard, but we had in April and March, we had snow even in Morocco and Mallorca. Mallorca yeah. and Morocco, they never had snow, ever. They had big snows. They lost actually all the lettuce, all these vegetables, Morocco. We were we had deficit for two weeks with the green vegetables in the UK because they couldn't supply. They needed to find quickly either Israel or some um, South American suppliers or something on. This is what happened. So now it doesn't matter they believe or not. The nature doesn't change. We didn't invent it. It is not our invention. We just recorded what the sun told us. And yeah. we pre suggested it will be coming. And I discovered that well before us, 14 years before us, people knew this. They didn't say that it will be exactly more than ground solar minimum, but they knew what was happened in the ground solar minimum, mountain minimum. And we have exactly the same picture now. So it is not a big surprise what we observe. And if you look, it is the plot of the spotless days for all uh, solar cycles observed so far, 25. And it shows increase of spotless days. So months since 10 spotless days. And cycle 25 has the highest increase out of all cycle 25 cycles uh, which occurred before which definitely tells you that we are heading to grand solar minimum. It is not a local minimum like Dalton or something. It is a grand solar minimum because uh, it increase of number spotless day is higher than any other previous cycles. So this yeah. is what we had. And, and cycle 20, uh, 26 should be even more impressive as far as spotless days. Yes. Yes. Cycle 26, remember on this plot, <laughs> It will be 70% amplitude will be 70% lower than the current cycle. So if we have now, what, say 150, you reduce it by 0.7, it will be less than, I think, 70 or 80. Yeah. Um, so for so those naysayers that are anti grand solar minimum that bring up some old graphs of sunspot data. And they claim that, well, during the Maunder minimum, uh, there was, you know, decades with no sunspots. What do you have to say to them? Uh, there were no decades. Remember, I showed you butterfly diagrams. Yeah. There were no uh, decades, uh, if I... Let me I mean, the point back. I'm trying to drive across is that even in these grand minimas, we have sunspots every solar cycle. We have, yeah. We, we have them at the time so here what we have in butterfly diagrams in, in the locations latitudinal so this is what for mount the ground solar minimum so there were some uh, years without sunspots but there were like locations and times but they have many sunspots like 1700 1710 1720 and between no sunspot this is what 
what we are more like um, we will be like this last three cycles so it will be uh as you see more more than grand solar minimum what we see so cycle 25 is here cycle 26 will be very poor no sunspot needed the cycle 27 will probably will be following the same number of sunspot like cycle 25 so this is what on the cycle 26 will be spotless so it means that the worst case scenario will come between uh, 2030 and 2045 but it will be worsening of course because volcanic eruptions will help and we will have a lot of ashes which and, not and only we... protect plane from flying but yeah. also protect sun getting to the earth which means the temperature on the earth will be dropping yeah, if we have a large VEI-6 or low-level VEI-7, it will drop the temperature for one to three years up to 1.5 C. Yeah. So definitely, during Mount, they calculated the temperature, as i shown here, dropped about one uh, average temperature by one here. The people did the Natal. Um, the solar radiance dropped by three watt per square meter you amount the minimum and the temperature dropped for about one degree of celsius so what we expect the temperature will drop during this grand solar minimum also by one uh, degree but it will be shorter it will be only probably half of mound uh, like this one the the last bit of droppage this is what we would expect. Now, we are headed into one of the strongest El Ninos. We just came out of a triple dip, La Nina. And mm -hmm. so for the next six to eight months, there's going to be, uh, there is warming in the Pacific. <clears throat> That's going to result in some warm temperatures and some heat waves. And so mm -hmm. that gives the alarmists a whole nother year to hang on to this nonsense because they're going to get what they need to publish in the media <laughs> because of El Nino. Well, they they claim they do not know when it is heating, but what uh, we come to another paper, which was indeed controversial because AGW people retracted the paper, which we published in uh, also in Nature Scientific Reports. But what we discovered, I don't know if we spoke about it, we produce our summary curve in here and um, this is the summary curve but we calculated backwards for 10 we actually calculated to 120,000 years and when we calculated we found that these grand solar cycles they have similar shapes and the shapes repeat in every five years this is red line on top do you see it yeah it's repeating so what we we did a very long time to understand why it is going we thought something periodic happening we couldn't find anything in the sun because solar dynamo doesn't give any indications for this um, periodic two millennium oscillations. But then we got observations, Reims et al. They show that the solar irradiance also oscillates with the two millennia period approximately. So this is what suddenly struck us that probably not happening on the sun, something happening with the orbital motion of the earth around the sun and sun as well so this is what we did we added this um, remember that we have northern polarity cycle and southern polarity cycle so if you add them together if uh, our earth is not shifted to sun anywhere if you add them together the sum should be equal to zero so basically we should arrive to the zero line right but when we added every 22 years cycles what we got we got this navy blue line we we discovered that the zero line slug suddenly oscillate with the 2000 year period hmm. so this was what and suddenly this 2000 year period coincide with this oscillation of solar radiance which reams et al reported and then others reported as well we now publish paper which called periodicities of solar activity it published in natural science so you can also find it if you 
and it is free so it, everyone can download it is like um, nature uh, papers so they you do not to pay we paid to them to all people have free download so basically what we discovered with this blue line that dear line of magnetic field oscillate so you you have this sun which uh, flies sits on the center what is this you have sun sitting here and the earth rotating around the sun and what we discovered that this uh, magnetic field either inclined towards northern pole or towards southern pole so what we we needed to think what makes it then we needed to understand where we are in this 2000 year cycle to, to yeah 2000 so we discovered that minimum or the southern polarity was during mountain minimal. And then we are now heading that this uh, zero magnetic line will no, head into the northern polarity, which means that the sun has to move to the earth when the earth is inclined towards the sun with the northern pole, right? And this happens when, this happens when it turns out that not only the polarities they come there also solar irradiance follows the same plot to the two millennium oscillations so in and the temperature so when we look at this we look at the solar inertial motion so it means all the planets they rotate around the body center of solar system right all the planets and the earth as well but it turned out that the sun also rotates about this body center of solar system. And it turned out that it moves either closer to the earth in the spring equinox or closer to the earth in the uh, autumn equinox. So in this millennium, it moves towards the earth during the spring equinox. So the sun becomes closer to the earth in march to july to it means when the earth is inclined towards the sun with the northern pole the sun is closer to us than it is in the other part of the orbit so if you look at this picture i'll put here so your sun is sitting not in the cross of this action it moves somewhere here so it distance between earth and sun shortens and uh, it means that the earth gets much more heating during from february to july then it gets heating from september till january so when, when they say the el nino and ocean heats is because at that time remember that the earth is inclined in the during our winter when it is in the southern with the southern pole towards the sun in february right but the sun moves closer it means that the sun has to warm up all the ocean and all the australia during february and march this is why the temperature of the ocean increases and this is why agv people they never calculated this orbital motion they say we don't know why the ocean is heating but this is why it is heating and this is why uh, the temperature in all this El Nino appears but it is only when sun works as usual which is happening right now while the sun in the maximum of solar activity cycle 25 in 10 years when this or you know six years six seven years when the sun moves to the minimum between cycle 25 and 26 the solar activity drops completely all the heating will drop and will never come back even given the fact that the sun does not move further from this point it still will be in this point but when the boiler is switched off even if it is close to you it will not hit you you know this yeah so you need while the sun is working right now in the maximum of solar activity 
and it is closer to us. It hits the ocean, it hits southern hemisphere, because at this period from February to April, the Earth is turned towards the sun with the southern pole. And the southern pole has only one land, is Australia, and the rest is ocean. So the sun hits the ocean. This is why the ocean is so hot. But then the sun moves from April to July and turns toward the sun with the northern hemisphere, the northern pole. And this is what um, all heating will come to the northern hemisphere. Well, uh, that's bad, bad news for the alarmists. In five or six years, I don't know how they're going to exactly. be able to <laughs> keep pull the wool over our eyes. If you're looking for uh, Valentina's work, you can find it over at our website, uh, solargsm.com. Um, and you are doing independent research, Valentina, and people can donate to your cause. Do you, can you pull yes. up your website? Yes, I will put the donation, um, this website called the VS um, Research Enterprise and the solargsm.com. I will show you where this. So far, we had um, funding from companies. We were lucky. This is my website. If you look at this, so we didn't put donations yet there, but now I put we run out of the big donations. So we're uh, grateful if people start donating. We keep continue running. We have people who work in with us whom I pay for contributions, and we will be more than happy to distribute the truth about the present. All these presentations which are shown, you can go to my site and the blog. You can download this. So you see this presentation, comparison solar activity indices, you can put here presentation period of solar activities and this heating uh, because of the orbital motion of the sun, it is here. So you can download and explore my plots in your spare time. And plus you have also um, all the uh, YouTube presentation, which you can listen to what would be produced in here. I noticed ours is missing. Is because it's demonetized, or are we too controversial? Uh, I probably done. I missed it. Can you send me the link? It is yes, my I will. fault because I'm the one who put in. Probably I forgotten about uh, my interviews because I give so many interviews. Some I recorded, and some after time I forgot it. It's my fault. I apologize. I will correct it. We're not that butthurt. <laughs> I will put it and I will put it, put it, the, the monetize. I will, I will be honored they done it because when we published um, our paper in 2015, then one guy published in conversation that what Zharkova predicts ground solar minimum. No, it is not correct. It will not come. So I want, I have this um, uh, link actually present and i want to come back to this guy and say and you were saying <laughs> i want him to eat his words <laughs> well we got to wait about a decade till we're really in the thick of it but in the Not meantime we'll... another five five seven years so we'll be fine yeah in the meantime uh everyone check out zarkova's website make a donation if you can check out all the presentations she's constantly uploading there uh, it's a pleasure to talk to you. Uh, we love having you on. And at a pertinent time in the near future, we'll contact you and uh, get you back on the show. Okie dokie. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for coming. Yes. Be safe. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye.